Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. It's been raining super loudly today all day, so I've got about 15 minutes of good time to film this one right now, I hope. So let's get straight into the news. The big news from this week is the launch of AMD's new server CPU lineup, second gen Epic Rome, based on, of course, AMD's 7 nanometer Zen 2 architecture. Our usual disclaimer applies here. We don't usually cover server hardware and don't have a lot of experience with it, but I think there's enough exciting things here that will give us a good look at how AMD is shaping up in the server market, as well as how these CPUs might translate across to Threadripper in the future. A lot of the architectural stuff with AMD's Epic 7002 series, as they're calling it, is stuff we already know. The CPUs use an I.O. die design with up to 8 chiplets, providing a maximum of 64 cores. We're getting much more cache, double the AVX2 performance, about 15% better IPC, 128 PCIe lanes across the entire lineup, better memory support, and so on. What we're all interested in is the top end chip, the AMD EPIC 7742 for dual socket servers. This is a massively fast chip with 64 cores, 128 threads, and a base clock of 2.25 gigahertz with a max boost of 3.4 gigahertz. TDP sit between 225 and 240 watts, plus we're getting a huge 256 meg of L3 cache, eight channels of DDR4, PCIe 4.0 support, and so on. There are a lot of groundbreaking achievements with this lineup. The first is the price. AMD is selling the Epic 7742 for just $6,950 in bulk quantities. Now I say just $6,950, not because the chip is overly cheap, but because of how it stacks up against Intel's lineup. The Xeon Platinum 8280, for example, is their highest core count socketed server chip, and that costs a touch over $10,000 US dollars. But it's an even better deal than that because the Xeon 8280 supports just one terabyte of memory per socket, compared to Epic's two terabytes across the entire lineup. So that means the actual nearest competitor is Intel's Xeon 8280M, which increases memory support to two terabytes, but costs $13,012. So AMD is offering similar capabilities for half the price. But they're not even offering similar capabilities, really. Second gen Epic offers more memory channels, eight versus six, and more than double the PCIe lanes. And they're not even the same PCIe lane as Epic supports PCIe 4.0 versus 3.0. On top of all of this, day one benchmarks show Epic CPUs absolutely destroying Intel's Xeon lineup. It's rare that you see this sort of bloodbath when it comes to performance, and from testing at places like Anantec and Pharonix, they're showing stuff like a single Epic 7742 beating a dual Xeon Platinum 8280 configuration. So a $7,000 processor coming close to and outperforming two $10,000 CPUs. It's madness to offer this sort of performance at this sort of price, but it's what AMD's done. AMD also gets a huge win in performance per watt, which as well as raw performance and overall value is a key metric for the server market. Epic appears to consume slightly more power than Intel Xeons, but fix significantly higher performance with many more cores. When data centers deploy thousands of these CPUs, that is a huge win. Those that have tested the chips are calling this a significant win for AMD, some like Anantec even calling this a historic victory. That's great news for those buying off-the-shelf servers or CPUs on a small to mid-scale. We don't really know what AMD or Intel will charge for their CPUs when making large-scale deals with huge server providers. You'd imagine there would be discounts involved there, but it's still hard to see Intel being competitive unless they drop their contract prices significantly. This also gives us a good idea of what performance we can expect from workstation Threadripper CPUs CPUs, which is to say we can expect awesome performance, especially if AMD decides to launch a 64-core chip this generation. We don't know whether they will, but you can imagine even a 32-core part significantly improving the capabilities of today's workstation, so that's super exciting. We did see this article pop up which claims that AMD's Epic CPUs will cause problems in the data center because they run at 1.4 volts, which is allegedly higher than TSMC spec. Apparently this will cause stability and efficiency problems, however, this whole thing seems like rubbish and the same sort of problem we saw people complaining about with Ryzen on the desktop, which runs up to 1.5 volts and is normal behavior. AMD says that Epic is designed to run below the maximum voltages specified by TSMC, and we expect that while voltages may seem higher than we're used to, like with Ryzen, the chips are designed this way and will work fine. Certainly very interesting stuff coming from AMD's Epic server division, I think. This could see a bit of a swing towards AMD in the server market, although they are tend to be typically quite conservative customers, so it'll be interesting to see how much more market share they can gain with this.
In other AMD news, the company has brought back Rick Bergman to head up the computing and graphics business with a focus on high-end PCs, gaming, and the important semi-custom division for consoles. Bergman previously worked at AMD and before that ATI for a period between 2001 and 2011. After AMD bought ATI in 2006, Bergman served as head of AMD's product group, which oversaw both CPUs and GPUs. During this time, he headed up the launches of some of AMD's best GPU products, including the HD 4000 series and the initial launch of GCN. He left the company in 2011 to join Synaptics as CEO, which by all reports was a successful role for him. Now he is returning to AMD, which is a big coup for the company, and will work with Frank Azor, who was also hired recently from Alienware to head up its gaming team. Next up, we have a whole bunch of leaks surrounding upcoming partner cards for AMD's Navi GPUs. We've basically seen designs now from partners like MSI, Sapphire, XFX, and so on. We even have a review guide leak from ASUS for their ROG Strix product, so we know that everything is coming pretty soon. What we're hearing is that these cards will be launching next week, at least some of them, depending on how ready the OEMs are. Some partners like ASUS have publicly stated September for their products and seem to be sticking to it, while others will have cards next week. Needless to say, we will have reviews of custom cards as soon as we get some hands on time with it, hopefully around launch or shortly after. Samsung has revealed their 6th generation VNAND technology which brings modest improvements over the last generation. The specific gains Samsung are touting involve 10% lower latencies for read and write operations plus 15% lower power consumption. The new 6th gen VNAND chips feature up to 136 layers which required a new design, however by cutting down on the number of holes in the design they should be easier to manufacture. Samsung's initial offering will involve 256 gigabit 3D TLC VNAND chips for use in things like 250 gigabyte SSDs, and then later this year they'll progress to 512 gigabit chips, also using 136 layer VNAND. AMD, as promised, has removed PCIe 4.0 support from all non-X570 motherboards with their new adhesive revision, version 1.0.0.3 ABB. This is the same version that AMD launched last week as part of their community update, which also involved improvements to how Ryzen manages boost behavior, as well as beta fixes for Destiny 2. AMD has maintained at all times that X570 is the only platform that supports PCIe 4.0, as there is no guarantee older boards have the required Wide signal integrity to support PCIe 4.0 properly. Despite this, some vendors felt that they could just enable PCIe 4.0 on their boards anyway, which seemed to annoy AMD. So the latest adduce update ends support on older boards like X470 once and for all. If you want the latest adducer code with important fixes for Ryzen 3000, you'll need to give up PCIe 4.0 on non-X570 platforms. This will probably annoy some that liked having PCIe 4.0 on their last gen boards, but really this shouldn't be much of an issue for regular users as PCIe 4.0 isn't bringing many improvements over 3.0 right now, aside from with very new and super high-end SSDs. It seems that Dell will be one of the first OEMs to bring Intel's Ice Lake CPUs to customers. Last week we learned about Intel's full Ice Lake lineup for ultra portable laptops, although the company wasn't specific in when these chips would be available outside of vague holiday season timeframe. However, it turns out that these chips might reach customers earlier than the holiday season with Dell set to launch a laptop that integrates them in early September. The laptop in question is a new XPS 13 2-in-1 model, the 7390. There will be several models available using either the Core i3-1005G1, the Core i5-1035G1, or the Core i7-1065G7. All of these are 15 watt U-series chips, the naming here is still terrible, but the 5 at the end of the product numbers denotes U-series. Interestingly, only the Core i7 laptop will provide the full benefits of Intel's Gen 11 graphics with 64 execution units. Other hardware used here is standard stuff. We have a 13.4-inch 1920x1200 display with HDR capabilities, up to 32GB of LPDDR4X memory, and up to 1TB of PCIe 3.0 storage. The new XPS 13 2-in-1 will start at $999, and hopefully we'll be able to get one soon for our Ice Lake reviews. That's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe to get this segment in your inbox every week. Consider supporting us on Patreon as well, and I'll catch you in the next one.